All right, we are at P4, day two, still talking about all those objectives, but the two that we hadn't hit yet, we're really talking about the perpendicular and the parallel, and then the real world situations. So that's what we have left for P4, day two, and we did already pre-rate ourselves, so now we need to wait until after the lesson, and then we can go back and do the rating. So objective, students will be able to use the concepts of slope and y-intercept to graph and write linear equations in two variables. Well, we've been doing that but we didn't hit the parallel and perpendicular part yet. So that's what we have to get to. So all the way back to the G word, geometry, to talk about parallel and perpendicular lines. And we would have an algebraic test. So two non-vertical lines are blank if and only if their slopes are equal. Well, those are parallel. And back in the geometry book, you learned a couple of kind of slanted um, little line segments there. Really, that's how we write parallel. Some books have even gone too straight up and down, but that's kind of scary because it almost looks like absolute value bar. So two non-vertical lines are parallel if and only if their slopes are equal. That's an algebraic test. We can do that. We can figure out what their slope is and we can compare it. Two non-vertical lines are blank if and only if their slopes m sub 1 and m sub 2 are opposite reciprocals. Oh, that's perpendicular. And that has a symbol that looks like an upside down T. Now, that is actually not the uh, definition that you had in geometry. Your definition in geometry said if you take their slopes and you find the product, so you multiply them together, you're going to get negative one. But this is how we think of it. I mean, this is what we do when we want to write equations for perpendicular lines. Opposites and reciprocals. So there's the opposite piece. And this little to the negative one is notation for reciprocals. Because to the negative one power truly is going to make that a fraction. It's going to flip it over and make it one over m sub two. So we've got the slope of one line, m sub one, and m sub two. Those are little subscripts, so that's why we say sub. Now, example five says, finding an equation of a parallel line. Find the equation of the line through the point p, one, negative two, that is parallel to the line l with the equation 3x minus 2y equals one. So what I have to do is think, well, if I'm going to write this thing, I'd really like a point and a slope. And I have to start with the slope. Can't see it from that. I need it in slope-intercept form so I can see what the slope is. So I'm going to go ahead and get this into y equals mx plus b by subtracting 3x from both sides and then dividing by negative 2. Now I can see what the slope of that first line was. The slope of that first line was 3 halves because in y equals mx plus b, I can see that the m is 3 halves. Now, it said parallel. Parallel means I have to use that same slope. So over here, I'm going to make it really clear that I'm using a slope of 3 halves. And I'm going to go ahead and use the point they gave me, 1, negative 2. And I'm going to write an equation for that line. So y minus a negative 2 would be y plus 2 equals 3 halves times the quantity x minus 1. Remembering the slope intercept, or sorry, the point slope form, y minus y sub 1 equals m times x minus x sub 1. Now, again, we generally put those into slope intercept form. And it's kind of a good catch because then you'll be able to make sure that, yes, your slope is exactly the same. So we distribute the three halves. And then we're going to need to add, oops, subtract 2 because I have a plus 2 already, from both sides. But it's in halves, so that would be minus 4 halves from our fraction over there. Again, if you look at this, you realize it's balanced. I am just subtracting 2 from both sides. I've only manipulated the way that it looks to deal with the fractions. So my answer would be y equals 3 halves x minus 7 halves. And then I can check. Oh, yeah, the slope is still 3 halves. Good, that's what I needed. 
Now, the one thing that kind of bothers me about this problem is that they have this line and they've named it L, but um, the slope for the equation for the line would just have x's and y's in it. So uh, that was kind of extraneous information. We didn't need that to do this problem. So sometimes that happens. There'll be information in there that we can just kind of ignore. B says, find the equation of a line through the point 2, negative 3 that is parallel to the line L with the equation y equals negative 4x plus 3. I want you to pause the video and try this one and see what you get. Now that you've started back up, we can see this time the slope is negative 4. How lucky for us. That was in slope-intercept form. So now all I have to do is use that along with the point 2, negative 3 in my point-slope form. So y minus a negative 3 will be y plus 3. And then we'll have a slope of negative 4, x minus 2 on the other side. Again, we tend to distribute and then add, subtract the 3, and we'll be able to get this into slope-intercept form. So that'll be negative 4x plus 8. And, oops, getting ahead of myself. I do that. I'm thinking about the next step. And my hand doesn't keep up with my brain. All right. y equals negative 4x plus 5. I can see the slope is negative 4. That's what it was supposed to be. So, parallel, we got it. There they are. And you can graph them on the graphing calculator and see that too, which, again, kind of silly because we know from the algebra that if the slopes are the same, they're going to be parallel. Just be kind of a nice check to say, yes, I'm absolutely right. A, for example, 6 is finding an equation of a perpendicular line. So find the equation of a line through the point 1, negative 2, that is now perpendicular to the line L through 3x minus 2y equals 1. And if your brain right now is saying, I think I've seen that before, that's because we already used that one for example 5a. Now it wouldn't take us too long to get it in y equals mx plus b form again. If we didn't notice that, but there it is, y equals 3 halves x minus 1 half. So the slope of this one was 3 halves. That's what we used for parallel, but we're not doing parallel this time. So we want to write the slope of the perpendicular equals so that we don't accidentally use that 3 halves. Opposite and reciprocal, negative two-thirds. Now we're cooking with gas. Let's go ahead and put that into that point-slope form. y minus a negative 2 will be y plus 2 equals negative two-thirds times the quantity x minus 1. Again, we'll take this all the way into slope-intercept form. So y plus 2 equals negative two-thirds x plus two-thirds. And then we would subtract 2 from both sides, but 2, when you're talking about 6, is going to be, or I'm sorry, when you're talking about thirds, I'm giving the answer already. Like I said, my brain and my hand are not working together in uh, tandem today. So we are going to be subtracting 6 thirds from both sides. So y equals negative 2 thirds x, and then 2 thirds minus 6 thirds would be minus 4 thirds. So y equals negative 2 thirds x minus 4 thirds. Yeah, it's perpendicular. The slope is the opposite and the reciprocal. So that's what we needed. So now, let's go to B. Again, pause the video. Give this one a try. Give yourself the opportunity to see perpendicular. Just like before, we can see the slope this time. And now, we need the slope of the perpendicular. So the slope of the perpendicular is the opposite and the reciprocal. Think of that as negative 4 over 1. And that will make it positive 1 fourth. Now we're going to put that into point slope form with the point 2, negative 3. So y minus a negative 3 is y plus 3 equals our slope of 1 fourth times the quantity x minus 2, and just like we've done all along, we will absolutely distribute 
One fourth times negative two is negative one half. If you are having trouble doing that in your noggin, make that a negative two over one and do um, numerator times numerator, denominator times denominator, and go from there. And then we need to add three or subtract three from both sides. We have add three, subtract three. And in halves, that would be minus six halves. So y equals one fourth x minus seven halves. So again, we can see, yeah, our slope is right. You know, it's the opposite and reciprocal slope that we needed there. So another big objective, big check mark. We've got that one out of the way. And now the rest of this is going to be about applying those linear equations in two variables, using them for stuff in the real world. Linear equations in the graphs occur frequently in applications. Algebraic solutions to these application problems often require finding an equation of a line and then solving it, solving a linear equation in one variable. And grapher techniques complement algebraic ones. Yeah, you know, if you've got a graphing calculator to check your work and you have time, check your work. So example seven says, finding the depreciation of real estate, Camelot Apartments purchased a $50,000 building and depreciates it $2,000 per year over a 25-year period. Wowzers, that's a crummy building. $50,000, that must really be roach infested there. But you know what, it's, or maybe it's the time. Maybe this is uh, 50 years ago that they bought this building. So let's hope for the best. Now, here's what I know. It started off as $50,000. So A says write a linear equation giving the value Y of the building in terms of the years X after the purchase. The year that they bought it was the zero year and they bought it for $50,000. Now, don't put an extra comma in 50,000. Remember when you're putting numbers into those ordered pairs, we don't do that. Too many commas will be confusing for folks. And then what I have to do is figure out, oh, wow, I'm lucky. That, that's the intercept. Maybe I can do y equals mx plus b if I can figure out what the slope is. Well, I can because it's average rate of change. And they are telling us here the average rate of change is $2,000 per year depreciating. So the slope is negative $2,000 per one year, or negative 2,000. Super. I love that. Y equals mx plus b. Y equals negative 2,000 x plus 50,000. Right there. So there's our equation, nice and easy. Don't get that intercept very often, but we have it here. So B says, in how many years will the building be $24,500? Oh, that's easy to find out, because that's our Y. Our Y is standing for the value of this property. So we can put $24,500 on the left-hand side of our equation. And uh, we can go ahead and solve it algebraically because, again, you, know, you try not to use the graphing calculator for solving. You show your algebraic skills. So let's subtract 50,000 from both sides. Lots of zeros to keep track of there. And that's going to give us negative 25,500. And we shall divide by negative 2,000. And that will give us 12.75. Now, this is a word problem. So in word problems, we do tend to use decimals. Remember what we talked about in class, and that is that we always go three decimals in pre-calculus. If we have to. 12.75 does not require a third decimal because it's it's done. It's 12.75. What it does require is a label. Now, sometimes we'll write out, you know, a sentence to say this is everything that we have here. But it's pretty obvious here. The question just wants to know in how many years will the building be $24,500? And, and we can tell them. There it is. Now, we could put this into the graphing calculator. Absolutely could. And we could absolutely figure out when it is $24,500. So I want to take you through that step 
of checking. We're going to go into y equals with our graphing calculator, and we're going to put our equation, negative 2,000x. Oh, I should say be very careful to use the negative button. Don't put subtraction in front of that uh, 2,000, or the calculator will yell at you. It does that. I'll tell you, you got a syntax error. So negative 2,000x plus 50,000. I always have to stop and make sure I have enough zeros because the graphing calculator on the smart board can be a little putsy and a little slow. All right, so now, window. This is the important part because you have to think. Um, it said this was happening over a 25-year period. So I want to see 0 to, ah, let me go 30 years maybe, and I can see a little bit more. And I don't mind that it's going by ones. That makes no difference to me at all. But what I have to see is uh, the answer, which was the 24,500. So I'll maybe go all the way to the 50,000 that it started at so I can make sure that I see that. So now, when I hit graph, there it is. And it is depreciating. Absolutely it is. And what I wanted to know, so I'm going to put y equals in there, is when is y $24,500? Now, when I graph it, it's going to show the intersection of those two lines. And the even better news is that we can let the calculator figure out where that is for us with my pet Blinky. Blinky is my pet cursor on my graphing calculator. Totally hypoallergenic. Everybody can be around him, and he's lots of fun, and he does lots of good math for us. Second trace. We are going to have Blinky find number five for us. So you can either press number five or you can scroll down, whatever you do. Now, Blinky's a little playful. Blinky says, is this the first curve you want me to do? Yes, it is, Blinky. If it weren't, we'd start hitting some of those arrow buttons and get it where we go. But it is, so I'm going to hit enter. And then Blinky says, is this the second curve we want to play with? Yes, it is, Blinky. So I'm going to hit enter. And then, still, playful Blinky says, would you like to take a guess? Well, you could. I'll move it over here and say, Blinky, I think it's about right there. But in the end, you're going to hit enter anyway. And look at that. There's our x equals 12.75. But all of this hinges on the fact that we wrote the correct equation. So we have to write the correct equation. We have to do the math to back it up. And this is just a quick check of that to see that things work. But good to know that we have Blinky to cover our backs. Good to see you, Blinkster. Now, those crummy Camelot apartments. We're done with those. We're going to look at example eight, <coughs> Pardon me. which is um, still talking about real world problems here. This is finding a linear model for Americans' personal income. Americans' personal income in trillions of dollars whoo, is given in figure P.30. And I see the little table here, and it's labeled trillions of dollars, all that good stuff. And it says write a linear equation for Americans' income Y in terms of the year X using those two points. Okay, so that's what we'll do. Um, if we have those two for our points, well, then we're going to go ahead and do slope. So 9.2 minus 8.9, m equals 9.2 minus 8.9, over 2003 minus 2002, which what we're really finding is the average rate of change of this income. So that's going to be 0 0.3 over 1, which is 0 0.3. And again, this is real world, so decimals happen. And then I have to decide which of these two I would like to use in slope, point slope form. So. I think I'm going to stick with the smaller numbers here, the 2002 and the 8.9, although it's not that much smaller. So y minus 8.9 equals 0 0.3 times the quantity x minus 2002. We distribute. So 0 0.3x minus 600.6. And then we add that little 8.9 to both sides. And y equals 0.3x minus 591.7. Now, what I'm interested in is, is how good is that? You know, how, how close is that to perfect? 
And our calculator uses a method called, called least squares regression to get that equation. So this was just, they picked two points on there and they said, go for it. You know, figure out what that equation is. Now, I went ahead and punched these in ahead of time to the graphing calculator so we could get a good look at what would the least squares regression be. And how we do that is we go into the stats and then number one, edit. And then I entered all of those years in as list sub one, popped over and entered all of those trillions of dollars that we had in list sub two. And I'd like the calculator to tell me the equation for the line of best fit. So to do that, we're making it do some work, but it's still under stats. So back to stats. I'm asking it to calculate that for me. So I arrow over once. And what I want is the line of best fit, which is known as linear regression. So I can either scroll down to number four, or I can hit four and enter. And it's asking me, okay, where did you put this stuff? Yeah, I did put the X's in list sub one. I did put the X's in list sub one. I did put the Y's in list sub two. Um, not worried about this, well, frequency list or store right now. What I want to do, is go down to calculate and hit enter and there it is so how close are we talking here let's let's see 0.571 x because we go three decimal places minus 11.35 point 295. So, I notice my slope is off by, well, less than three tenths. That's a big deal. My B, well, because my slope was off a little bit, you know, then the end is going to be bad. But those weren't points I chose. Those were points that the book said, take these. If I was choosing, I would have drawn a line of best fit in here. And again, what you try to do with your line of best fit is a bit, get about the same number of points above and below your line. So I probably wouldn't have picked those two points. I would have picked something up here and something down here because that would be the better way to go. But still, not, not too shabby, you know, when you think about all of the things that could happen. So by hand, it's not awful. And then B says what we need to do is use this information. So use the equation in A to estimate the income in 2005. So now that all the bells are off, we'll put that in there. So we had our 0 0.3, and we want to know what's going to happen in 2005. And then there's our 591.7 back there. And all we do is plug this into the calculator, 9.8. 9.8 what? Well, our X's up there were trillions of dollars. So 9.8 trillion dollars. And then C says, use the equation again, predict Americans' income in 2010. Well, we're just changing one number. And again, it's just calculator work. Unless, you know, you want to do it by hand. Take you a little longer, but you could. So that's going to be 11.3. That trillion dollars is a really, really big deal. So D says superimpose the graph of the linear equation in A on the scatter plot of the data. Now, I'm not going to use ours. I'm going to go ahead and use the calculator one and, and superimpose that one. And how we do that is by letting the calculator know that we want it to store all this good stuff. So it's going to calculate it, stats, calculate it, and it's number four, linear regression. So this time, I'm going down into store. And what I want it to do is to put this into the y equals so that it'll graph my line. So I need to get a variable. So I hit V-A-R-S, variables. It's just to the left of the clear key. And then I want the Y variables right there. So what I have to do is arrow over once to Y variables. And I am graphing functions, so number one. And here it lets me choose which one I'm going to put that in for. And I'm just going to hit number one. And down to calculate and enter. 
So this is really cool. Decimals and all, if you hit y equals, it goes right in there. And now when I hit graph, oh, I have to turn my stat plots on. Second stat plots. Um, got them turned off right now. Number one, turn it on. We want a scatter plot. And I'm using list one and list sub two. That's a good mark. Looks good. Window. Well, our X's were those years. So that was 2002 to 2007. So let's try 2000 to 2010. And our Y's, ah, we can start with zero. But our trillions of dollars, it ended at 11.7. So maybe I'll put a 20 in there. Oops, not in the min. There we go. So we can see the trillions of dollars. Now that's a good line of best fit. That's not the one we were using, but that's the line of best fit. So let's put ours in there. And I love that this is a color one, because now we'll see our red one. And our red one was our um, 0.3x. And then we had minus 591.7. So let's see how far that uh, is from that line of best fit that we had with the calculator. And yeah, yeah the slope was off, so you know the intercept's going to be off a little bit too, but not too shabby. So that is a reminder from Algebra 2 because you did do linear regression back in Algebra 2. Now, the chapter opener problems that we have here are always a good follow-up. And this problem says, assume that the speed of light is approximately 186,000 miles per second. So there it is. It took a long time to arrive at this number. See the note below about the speed of light? Well, yeah, we're going to look at all this good stuff, but you could go back to that chapter, open our page two, and take a peek at it. If the distance from the moon to the earth is approximately 237,000 miles, find the length of time required for light to travel from earth to the moon. We turn on a flashlight, a really powerful one. How long would it take to get there? Well, what we know right now is that this is 237,000 miles. And I want this information in terms of time. And I realize, well, that's this. So if I can take my 237,000 miles and divide that by 186,000 miles per one second, when I multiply by the reciprocal, I'm going to get what I want. So you grab a calculator and you take 237,000 and you divide it by 186,000 and it is 1.27, rounding to three decimal places, 1.274 seconds. Turn on the flashlight, 1,001, oh, probably about there. The light will hit Mars. If light travels from the Earth to the Sun in about 8.32 minutes, Approximate the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Oh, that sounds good. The problem is that's in minutes. And our stuff up there is in seconds. So we're going to have to take our 8.32 minutes times 60 seconds in one minute. And using unit analysis, the minutes labels would drop out, and we would be left with the seconds that we need. So that would give us 499.2 seconds. And we know that for each one of those seconds, it is 186,000 miles per second. So seconds would drop out, and we would take 499.2 times 186,000, and that would give us 92,851,200 miles. 
So this chapter opener has a, a little bit here that reminds us of unit analysis, um, also called dimensional analysis in science class, who are just using what we already know from the past. If it takes five hours and 29 minutes for light to travel from the sun to Pluto, approximate the distance from the sun to Pluto. Oh, that's a lot of seconds. We better figure out what that is, huh? So we've got five hours and we could change everything to, to minutes first and then we could go ahead and change to seconds. So that's going to be 300 plus the 29. So 329 for our scratch in the smart board here. 329 minutes. And then we have to change that into seconds. So we're going to take that time 60 seconds in one minute. And our minutes will cancel out. And we will get a grand total of 19,740 seconds. And again, we wanted to know if it takes that long, what's the distance from the sun to Pluto? So we have to take 19740 seconds times 186,000 miles in one second. Again, unit analysis says those two labels of seconds will drop out. And it is something I'm not going to be able to fit there. Equals 3,671,640,000 miles. So, very good reminder about unit analysis, dimensional analysis, whichever of the um, courses that you're talking about at a time, whether or not it's math or science. Now, usually, we would just ask you to take a peek at the quick review from P4 down here and see if there are any of those that you feel that we need to do together. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the video and I'm going to go ahead and put the answers up there. That way if somebody wanted to do these problems, at least you could check your answers. And then I'll start it up briefly before I give you the homework. All right, so at this point, you can pause it if you wanted to, if you had done all of these problems and you wanted to check and see if they're correct. And if you need to ask me about something, ask. You know, we can talk about it in class for a couple of minutes. Um, there is the assignment for P4 Day 2. Please don't forget to go back to your yellow lesson objectives and rate yourself after the lesson. Then once you've finished up the homework, you can rate yourself after the homework on all of these wonderful concepts. But lots and lots of reminders. You know, these are, these are things that you knew before. You just needed a little bit of a refresher.